Hey there, welcome to YouTube. If you are into poetry, if you are into literature, if you are into cultural history, then you've come to the right place. Cardboard Box Productions makes podcasts about all those things, so be sure to click the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that you never miss a new episode. Obviously, we mostly make podcasts, so you can also go to anywhere you get your podcasts, if it's a, a place other than YouTube, uh, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and you can subscribe to our podcast feeds there. All right, I hope you enjoy this episode. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Close Talking, the world's most popular poetry analysis podcast from Cardboard Box Productions Incorporated. I am co-host Jack Rossiter Munley, and with my good friend Connor McNamara Stratton, we read a poem, talk about the poem, and read the poem again. Before we get into today's selection, a quick note that if you like what we do here at Close Talking and have a spare minute of your time, it would mean the world to us if you would give the podcast a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews help boost us up the algorithm and find new listeners. And if you have suggestions for future episodes or comments on this one, you can send us an email at closetalkingpoetry at gmail.com. And you can also find us on social media. On Twitter, the show is at Close Talking. I am at Jack Rossiter Munn, and Connor is at Connor M. Stratton. On Instagram, the show is at Close Talking Poetry, and on Facebook, it's facebook.com slash close talking. We also have a website, closetalking.com, where you can find all the past episodes of the show, and Cardboard Box Productions has just launched a newsletter, Unboxed, and if you go to cardboardboxproductionsinc.com, you can subscribe for more behind-the-scenes stuff on Close Talking and all of the other literary and cultural history podcasts that Cardboard Box Productions makes. On with the show. Welcome to an all-new episode of Close Talking. I'm one of your co-hosts, Connor McNamara Stratton. And I am your other co-host, Jack Rossiter Mumley. And as always, as always, we have a wonderful poem. This poem is called Emplumata. And it's by the poet Lorna D. Cervantes, who is one of the great poets of the latter half of the 20th century. She's a leading major formative voice in um, Chicana literature, as well as Native American literature and American literature at large. She's been in numerous anthologies, including the Norton Anthology of Literature. Her first book, which is where this first poem comes from, and in fact is the title poem, Emplumata, her first book, won um, an American Book Award. Yeah, she's a really fascinating person, and this poem is amazing. And the one bit of context, which we can get to more in depth, is emplumata means something between pen flourish and feathered. The more literal meaning, I think, is feathered, but it involves pen flourish. This now marks the third time, Connor, that you have picked a poem with a one-word title with, like, a cryptic word as the title. Oh, oh it no. seems like about every 15 episodes, because our third episode was Orphan Atrophia, and then, <laughs> and then we had Jordan Rice's Epithalamian. Oh, yeah. And uh, now here we are with Emplumata, so it, it's a everybody trip. get ready. In, like, another 15 episodes, we're going to have... Sesquipedalian, the poem. <laughs> My sincerest apologies. No, no, no. I think it's amazing. I just happened to notice, like, interesting. It's a true. A yeah. pattern is forming here. That's a good point. I'll have to do some self-reflection, see if that's coming from a particular place. But first, before that reflection, Emplumata. When summer ended, the leaves of snapdragons withered taking their shrill colored mouths with them. They were still, so quiet. They were violet where umber now is. She hated, and she hated to see them go. Flowers born when the weather was good. This she thinks of, watching the branch of peaches daring their ways above the fence and further, two hummingbirds hovering, stuck to each other, 
arcing their bodies in grim determination to find what is good, what is given them to find. These are warriors, distancing themselves from history. They find peace in the way they contain the wind and are gone. That's it. That's a poem. It's a pretty cool poem. It's so good. I'm obsessed with this poem. I can't believe I hadn't read it until I read it recently because it's so good and I feel like everyone should read it. Tell me more of your obsession. Why Why are you obsessed with this poem? Oh, man, well, okay. Um, to me, it has a kind of, it's a perfect kind of poem to me where you have a, a beautiful and very clear literal scene. So you have summer ending, which is a very sort of classical trope in poetry. Keats's to autumn, which is also a reflection on death. Uh, you have Shakespeare sonnets, um, you know, when yellow leaves are none or few do hang. So we have that kind of like deep echo already in the beginning. Emily Dickinson's As Imperceptibly as Grief. The list could probably go on for as long as I have been alive. But there's just beautiful images here in the first stanza. The leaves of snapdragons withered, taking their shrill colored mouths with them. Shrill colored? Amazing. I love that. Shrill is not a color, but I can see it. And it evokes something that we don't exactly know why yet, but maybe we get to it later. And then we have the introduction. So then we have a scene. We have a she. She's sad. She hates that they're going. Um, she also hates generally, which we should return to. I love that part. But then the poem moves into this kind of more abstract, figurative realm by the end. These are warriors, referring to the hummingbirds, distancing themselves from history. They find peace in the way they contain the wind and are gone. Hummingbirds as warriors, hummingbirds distancing from history, hummingbirds containing the wind. These are all huge things. And I just love when poems really get us in a particular space and then just do that sort of dramatic departure at the end into, well, there's a lot going on, but something much vaster than sort of what we were dealing with in the beginning. But everything I'm going to say, the podcast is going to be why I love the poem. So I can't just talk for 30 minutes straight because you have to say something, Jack. So, well, I, what's <laughs> nice about a poem that you're obsessed about is that you can, you can talk for 30 minutes straight about it because there's so much stuff, particularly a poem like this, where there's so many different little moments that are going on. You pointed out shrill colored because you would expect it to be taking their shrill comma colored mouths. So it's like the mouth of the snapdragon is shrill and then it also has colors to it. But no, no, no. It's shrill colored as a hyphenated thing that's like, whoa, what's that? That's super cool. I don't know what's going on there. I need to think about this a lot more, um, which is pretty exciting. I'll tell you why I became obsessed with this poem. I'm into it. I love it. So there were two things that I noticed about it that got me going down this road. And it, I want to come back to your point that there's like a departure at the end of the poem, because I'm curious to what degree it is a departure and to what degree it is in some ways a little bit of a perhaps summation or resolution of the poem. So Whoa. here are the two things I noticed Whoa. that got me thinking this way, right? Okay. I noticed that there are three stanzas to the poem. Yes. And I noticed that in the middle of the poem, there's a big change. And this got me thinking about the classic three act story structure. And I realized that this poem can very neatly and easily fit into it. So let me take you on a quick little journey oh and then you God. can tell me if you think I'm full of it. So at the beginning, act one is stanza one. It's the setup. We are introduced, we are given exposition about the world and introduced to the protagonist. We are told what the world looks like, summer is ending, and we meet our protagonist, she, she who hates. So that's our setup and that's our main character. Our inciting incident is the withering of the snapdragons, I would say. Yeah. We then move to our first plot point, 
which I think is our protagonist noticing and then hating this withering and also kind of more generally hating. So not a particularly balanced temperament for our protagonist at the beginning. We then move into act two, where we have confrontation, rising action, trying to reckon with this. She's looking at all of these other evidences of change and we can intuit becoming more upset about it. And then we have our midpoint reversal. We go from all of these plants to the injection of these birds, literally in the very middle of the poem, in the middle of the second stanza or second act, we have the shift of the focus from the plants to the birds. And this can be similar to like in a mystery story, they've been looking for a male culprit the whole time, but then they find out a woman did it. And then that just radically changes the investigation. That would be like a pretty standard midpoint reversal for how a new piece of information radically changes the nature of the story that's being told. So we have the injection of the birds, and then we have our second plot point, which is that we move from just noticing these birds to, oh, wait a minute, they are arcing, and they're trying to find what's good, and they're warriors of some sort. So like noticing the nature of the birds becomes our next plot point for from the point of view of our protagonist noticing stuff. And then we transition into our third act, or third stanza, which is the resolution of this conflict, and that comes to this climax of these are warriors line break into distancing themselves from history. So in some ways it seems like these birds are fighting against the changes that are going on in the plants, but it turns out, no, 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 no. These hummingbirds quite literally, which are flighty, these hummingbirds, they're full of wonder, they're full of majesty, but they themselves embody the same kind of change and transience that the change of the seasons does. And if I can find beauty in these hummingbirds and what they are getting up to, maybe as the protagonist, they can also then find the beauty in the change of the seasons. So this is the journey our protagonist has gone on in the story from hating generally and hating the change of the seasons to through their journey and interaction with these hummingbirds and appreciation of what they can embody coming to a fuller resolution with regards to their feeling about the change of the seasons. So that was my little journey I went on with the poem of slotting it into a pretty standard story structure and thinking about it that way. That is fascinating. Okay, one, lots of things. Um, with three-act structure, one thing that one of my professors, the great short story and novelist Charlie Baxter, told me about three-act was that the first act is the naming of a desire. And then the second act is the sort of desire or like steps are taken to get it, but something crazy happens or like the desire is inverted or uh, does not go as planned. And then the third is a kind of tying up um, in a sort of way. So in, in that rendering, which is just a rephrasing of what you've said is, is the kind of like the hating and hating to see them go is the sort of desire. The other way of saying that is the desire to see them stay, the desire for summer not to end. Then in some ways, I think perhaps these are warriors, the hummingbirds uh, represent at least what we think as potentially a kind of thing that will endure, I think, as you were saying. And so that they represent for the speaker a solution to the desire. But in the third stanza and the third act, you know, they find peace and are gone. But that, as you suggest, perhaps um, the speaker is not in the same place even though the hummingbirds weren't exactly what she wanted, because of everything that's happened, she's in a different place with it now. Also, initially, what the birds are to the speaker is this thing that is not changed by the seasons. And so, oh, there's like an eternal beauty and hopefulness there. But if you watch hummingbirds for any amount of time, you see them move about very quickly. They are, as I said, they're literally flighty birds. Like they are the definition of like constant movement and instability. And yes, they can hover in place almost unnaturally for a period of time, but then they sort of dart off. And so I think might, they might initially appear to be these warriors distancing themselves from history, but then it turns out they find peace in the way they contain the wind and are gone. They actually are just as transient, even in their being different. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. The one possible different reading that I have is in the last stanza you suggest that um, the speaker 
finds a kind of resolution, but also peace alongside the peace of the hummingbirds. Is that a sort of correct reading? Uh, I think no? it's unstated, but it's a possible intuitive reading from they find peace in the way they contain the wind and are gone. It doesn't state that the speaker then also feels peace, but I think you could go in that direction if you wanted to with it. Yeah. I don't yeah. think you have to by any stretch. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely one way to read it. I also think that, so the way that the lines are, you know, laid out, the last stanza is only four lines long, whereas the others are seven and seven. So it's seven, seven, four, I think. So the, the last stanza is noticeably shorter. And then it's distancing themselves from history is the first line. And then they find peace is the second line. And the way they contain the wind is the next line. And are gone is the last line. There's a suddenness to the vanishing that happens, I think, both in the shortness of the stanza and in the shortness of the last line. But the last line is only and are gone. Maybe this is like an overread, but to me, that sort of clipping off, I don't know if the speaker's in the place of, of hating it, but another way to read it is that even this piece that they find is gone. And to me, that is a, is a different kind of thing. There's, there's certainly finding beauty in the transient, I think, is one very um, reasonable reading. Um, but the other more negative reading that I think is, is also plausible is this kind of just momentary peace that will always vanish, even with, you know, these warriors or something. And to me, especially the way that the lines end so suddenly feels like if it were a more content, peaceful resolution, it would be a more drawn out or it would be an easier end, perhaps. I think that's an excellent point, particularly because the stanza is so much shorter. You almost expect there to be another almost half to it about what does this mean? Um, but it does leave it so open that it then ties back to the speaker hating that the flowers are going. And you can also intuit maybe hating that these birds are going that have suddenly become a symbol of, you know, oh, the flowers are gone. And of course, they're going to be going. And then, oh, there's also this branch of peaches oh, maybe these birds will stick around. Nope, they're gone too. Um, I think that's a really good point. But it's also very, so it's interesting because on the one hand, there's a reading of summer and its end as an end of beauty um, or an end of life. But the use of these are warriors distancing themselves from history feels very charged with a different kind of weight. And I also, and I don't know if this is something that I'm imposing upon the poem, but when I saw distancing themselves from history as to history, then I was rereading it. Then I get to the line, two hummingbirds hovering stuck to each other, this line arcing their bodies in grim determination. Suddenly the arc as a word to describe the hummingbirds makes me think of Immediately, the Martin Luther King, the arc of history, ultimately Ben's George Justice, um, which is a terrible paraphrase. But I don't know. I, and I feel like even beyond that quotation, though certainly I think she would be familiar with it, the arc of history is a, is a kind of phrase that's familiar. And so then I think that the hummingbirds, you know, are either like embodiments of history or sort of historical forces or something or or people caught within history perhaps that's more accurate as they're trying to distance themselves but then i'm trying to think what exactly is the history and one way that you could move which is sort of like to go outside the poem and i haven't read the entire collection of poems, but there was an interview with her where she was sort of talking about her first book. And she had said earlier, she said, reading African American women poets politicized me. Um, and she says, and it was the fact that poetry politicized me that had to do with then saving my life. And then she says about the book Emplumata, in a sense, I was trying to give back that gift 
that had saved me when I discovered again African American women's poetry. I was having this vision of some little Chicana in San Antonio going, scanning the shelves like I used to do, scanning the shelves for women's names or Spanish surnames, hoping she'll pull it out, relate to it. So it was intentionally accessible poetry intended to bridge that gap, that literacy gap. Thinking about that, and I think that a lot of the other poems in the book, sort of the speaker is more like explicitly sort of identified as Kana or, you know, from San Antonio, et cetera, speaks to that there's this oppressive history that sort of bears down on that kind of person. And these hummingbirds, you know, how do you escape that history? Or how do you find peace from the history? Um, it seems like on the one hand, you are, you are a warrior, you can fight it, or you can fight with it. But the hummingbirds are trying to distance themselves from it. So anyway, that was sort of one reading, but that, that reading re sort of requires thinking about the book, I think, as a whole. And it's not sort of like contained within the poem. So I'm curious if there are kind of like other ways that you were thinking about that, that line. That's really interesting. And I think it's, I think the degree to which it's contained in this poem is exactly as you point to it, both the reference to distancing themselves from history, which stuck out to me as a line, both because distancing themselves from history has a nice little sonic resonance going on distance and history that is sounds, but it also is this injection of something beyond just an individual observing the natural world, all of a sudden we're bringing in this big weighty concept of history. And it's also connected to immediately before it that these birds are warriors. And then before that, they are arcing their bodies in grim determination, which is not a phrase I would associate with hummingbirds intuitively. And so I'm already sort of pricked up for something to happen as soon as I see that they're arcing their bodies in grim determination. It's like the mere joy of these birds and their existence and their search for honey, which is, or not honey, but nectar from flowers, which is sweet. Their search for sweetness and their simple existence is a radical act in some way. That seems to me a fairly resonant idea and that they go about their duties with a grim determination rather than just a completely natural instinctual search is something that I find very interesting. I have a question about that little section which is these hummingbirds which are stuck to each other arcing their bodies you think are they doing it <laughs> um maybe I, yeah i thought they were doing it for a minute they, like that that what the speaker notices is a couple of hummingbirds doing it and then going about their business but that it's the moment of them doing it that sort of sticks out i think that makes a lot of sense i know little about hummingbird sex but i have google and apparently they don't mate in midair but they don't but, no. and they also uh, mate incredibly quickly if i'm not mistaken okay which well, is part of why i question this reading i see well i mean it is interesting that you bring that up because the line after that is to find what is good what is given them to find to me that's interesting because what is good could be anything, could be sex, but it could be like just chirping about like a hummingbird or whatever, whatever they I do. I took it to mean flower nectar as what is given them to find because there is nectar in flowers and hummingbirds. There are even species of hummingbird whose bills have evolved specifically to fit certain flowers. Like there's a very direct connection between the flowers that create the nectar and the hummingbirds who come to, to sip it up. So it seemed to me like it was pointing towards that connection more than anything. That sounds right to me. I would say could be that they're doing it, but it's not definitely the reading. And I think it could be something else. It's, it's the stuck to each other, hovering yeah, stuck to yeah. each other that got me paused because arcing their bodies in grim determination could just be them kind of two hummingbirds flying around each other. But I wasn't right. sure what to do with stuck to each other. Yeah, no, I I agree. I admit that I was immediately going to figurative meanings with that, with stuck to each other, just like that they're bound together in some way. And and kind of this kind of um, idea of being bound to something 
also seems to resonate a little bit with the second version of what is given them to find because it's not like they have a choice in some way it's like they're finding what is good but then it's like what is given them to find it's already been laid out for them you know you're gonna like nectar um so there's a kind of like narrowness of options where the good isn't totally up to you and that makes me think perhaps there's also that element of historical like determinacy or something that gets far out it's a little far up but i think it's definitely there because you're following giving them to find with these are warriors distancing themselves from history if it's preordained if it's an arc that is not but it's an arc that's already set out that's the like central danger to that martin luther king quote the arc of the moral universe is long but bends towards justice there's an inactivity that that can then create where it's like well if that's the case then i don't have to do anything when in reality no it's all of the people pulling on it that bends it towards justice it doesn't just happen through an action but that side of the quote can speak to this like well that's just how the world works and that's how history goes and there's bumps along the way but we always get there in the end when in reality you have to work really hard to make that actually happen yeah no that makes a lot of sense so one other direction which may be part of a similar direction now i'm thinking about distancing and distance is a thing i feel like we've talked about it in another podcast but i don't remember i feel like it's a common term in english studies studies of literature etc where there's a people talk a lot about the distance between say the protagonist or the speaker and the novel itself or the poem or the author or something and that there's a kind of you know locating that distance is is helpful in some way the boring example is just like a first person narrator novel where they're sort of bumbling and unreliable and maybe an asshole there's a kind of distance between the eye of the protagonist which pr- sort of purports to be the writer of the novel and the quote unquote novel itself which knows and lets you know that the you know that they they don't know everything or they're doing things wrong or they're not telling you the truth or something there's interesting levels of distance here that i was thinking about when i saw the actual word and that first part is that the use of she seems very interesting to me because the speaker is not actually present in the poem so a lot of times it's a, a first person i speaker where it's like it could easily be i hated to see them go but this is a kind of speaker who's like looking observing a she who is doing that Anyway, so that adds like a separate level of distance where now you have a third person in the poem, third person she, then you have a speaker, then you have sort of a poet or a poem. I find that interesting in that the other way that I was thinking about it was going back to the title which emplumata which has the the meaning one meaning of feathered but the other meaning can be pen flourish. I was looking it up and on Poetry Foundation, which is a wonderful site, they have a great critical essay that sort of is an overview of Lorna uh, de Cervantes' work. And they write this about it. The term emplumata can be translated as a combination of pen flourish and feathered. And it ties poetry's concern with beauty and myth to Cervantes' his own obsession with language. So, okay, where am I thinking? The reason why we got to think about this, and I'm getting very casual because I don't know where I'm going, is why is this poem called what it is? On the one hand, there's hummingbirds, so hummingbirds have feathers. But we start with flowers, and feathered also is like, it doesn't come up again. The feathers aren't specifically mentioned. Um, We never see feathers. And feathered is also like an interesting like past tense version of it where you it's like almost and then when you think about pen flourish it's like you're adorning something with feathers or something like that um so there's a very like conscious perhaps embellishment or at least like constructing of something or dressing up of something i guess the initial thought that i had was if the title is sort of interested in the flourish of language or 
the use of language to think about beauty and myth, then the distancing is a kind of like deliberate dressing up of the situation or something, I guess. Like what I want to say is that Cervantes wants to distance herself from history, but that is a crude reading. But instead, we have hummingbirds who are observed, who want to distance themselves, who are observed by a she who is observed by a speaker who is written by a Cervantes. And that's like four levels of distance, which is the real mind curse splatter, which is why I'm starting to talk very slowly. But to me, that seems like it's a, it's a, it's a very, the situation is very like explicitly constructed. Some situation, every piece of writing is constructed, but some are more sort of explicitly so. And so I, I wonder if there's a nod to the poem as a way to distance oneself, even if for a moment, from some kind of history that one doesn't want to always have to be a warrior in, and the poem as a way of finding peace. I think that's my thesis, but that's a re- I think that's really kind of crazy. So I, I really have, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop talking for quite some time. <laughs> that's super interesting uh and i like because you're right all writing is constructed but some writing points to the ways in which it is constructed and i think this poem does do that with some attention and with some volume at certain points and it is when you have a line that suddenly sticks out like you're describing a couple of hummingbirds and then you're saying that they're acting in grim determination that's a line that sticks out and points to, wait a minute, how far away are we from these hummingbirds again? Who's saying that they've got grim determination? Like it does a couple of different things when it is that quote unquote loud within the poem where yes, it makes you think more about what the hummingbirds mean, but it also is like, wait a minute, who's ascribing this description to them? And I like that you pull out the levels at which that is going on. I think the question that you brought up about why is this poem called Emplumata is also really important and is a curious one that I don't have a great answer for. I love where you went with it. I'll say the first thing I thought of was, again, an Emily Dickinson quote, which was, hope is the thing with feathers. And it seems like to a degree, the she in this poem is someone who is maybe looking for hope in the face of the withering end of summer. And so the evidence all around is of things decaying and of things falling apart or not sticking around and what the she in the poem, and maybe we can say also Cervantes as the one writing this is looking for is hope within the decay or within the constant change. Um, that the arc of history is a positive one as opposed to one that might at times look like it is not. And so the evidence that's given in the poem is that the change that is going on, the historical progression that is being observed in the natural world is one that is not necessarily positive. These flowers that were once beautiful are now sh- are now shriveled and withered and dying away. And these hummingbirds, which were this moment of you know feathered hope, really in the middle of the poem, like oh maybe these are where I'll see it. These brave, valiant warriors fighting against change. Oh wait a minute, nope, they're gone on the wind. That in some ways it is a poem looking for for hope. Yeah, I like that reading a lot. This is a slight departure, but I wanted to point out a small detail that I liked a little pattern, syntactical pattern, that I thought was sort of subtly done. There's, I think, at least three instances of like very subtle anaphora, a repetition that happens once and again, and then there's three sets of that. So there's, in the beginning, they were still so quiet, and then they were violet, where Umber now is. Then she hated and she hated to see them go. And then, this isn't quite an aphora, but to find what is good, what is given them to find. So there's a repetition of they were, then she hated, then what is. And what's interesting too is in a lot of those, they repeat at least the second to a similar thing. It's like, but it has a difference. Um, and I and the, the first one is just so like amazingly done it's she hated and then it's a line break and then it's and she hated to see them go which is so good because i feel like 
you see the line break, you're like, all right, we're emphasizing hated. And we're going to talk about what she hated. But this one's like, no, she just hated. Also, she hated to see them go. But first, she's just hating. She's in hatred. And I feel like that's like so expertly done with like basically just repetition and a very choice line break. And then similarly, to find what is good, what is given them to find is still about finding what is good. But in the second sort of version of it, we have a little more texture where it's the good that's given to them. And there's a there's a return of find sort of to find what is good, what is given to them to find. Yeah, I don't know. I just, I feel like there's, I really like that. And there's a kind of quietness too in a lot of the the sentences that feel similar. Um, you know, like they find peace in the way they contain the wind and are gone. The kind of and are gone is a is a really interesting way of talking about it. It could be and disappear. It could be vanish. It could be you know, and suddenly are gone, or we see them gone or whatever. But and are gone is like uses the verb are. So it's like the kind of it's the verb of being. So it, it takes away the kind of some kind of the, the action of it and moves it towards the being of it, which is the being of not being. Yeah. And, and that line, um, they were still so quiet. Um, I really like so yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of like they were, they are kind of thing. And I feel like that's a very deliberate move for the kind of quietness of the poem, but also the the sort of the change if we're thinking about the three act sort of change. Um, it's a it is a quiet one. It's not a one of violence, even if the hummingbirds are warriors, but it's it's a, a change of perception in almost in that kind of way to find peace in the way that and, and to see the hummingbirds in a different way, even if they're fleeting, we go with that reading. And for that kind of quiet shift, it makes some sense, I think, to have a quietness of syntax too. I really like that you brought that up. One other thing I would say about the three act thing, because uh, you're right, it's a way of basically staging change and conflict, but doing so over time and making it a little bit gentler. But the way it's also discussed is as a story arc or a character arc. So arc. Hey. Um, um, but you're right. It is a very gentle poem uh, with these sort of moments of greater aggression contained within it, but they are not syntactically aggressive. There isn't really any hyper-aggressive line break. There isn't any hyper-aggressive construction of the words themselves. There are just more aggressive words that show up occasionally. Yeah. And that actually, I think, is what is so cool is that the feelings that the she feels are very intense and the feelings that the hummingbirds have are very intense, but it's a separate feeling than how we feel about those feelings in some kind of way, perhaps. And so it conveys both the the intensity of that, you know, she hated, and you're like, oh, like that's, I mean, that's intense to say, like just blanket hatred. And as you were noting, you know, arcing their bodies in grim determination is there is a real a sense of high stakes and sort of intense feeling. But I think a, a lesser poem would be like, well, those are what's important. So I'm going to make the poem be like as intense as the feelings that like are sort of at the heart of the poem. But in in having the sort of quietness and the gentleness of the syntax sort of in tension with the intensity, the image, and the feeling, I think allows for a more revelatory ending. The ending, in a sense, is almost where the feeling of the poem finally matches up with the gentleness of the syntax, because the syntax is quiet and gentle all the way through, but you have shrill colored mouths and you have these decaying flowers and then you have the hummingbirds and they're grim and they're warriors. But then at the end, you have finding peace and contain the wind and are gone, this really gentle syntax matched with a gentler message at the end. And then also at the same time, ending with gone still carries with it, like ending with absences 
is still, even as it's gentle, which I agree with, has something of that intensity. So it is a kind of synthesis of the two. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. It's a, it's a gentle intensity, a gentensity. A gentensity. Oh, man. <laughs> a gentensity. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, I, I, I think not. It is funny, though. It's, it was funny to hear and to say. It gave me delight for a moment, even if it should never happen again. And what more can I ask for in this life than to bring you delight for but a moment? Ah, oh, Jack, you're the man. Do you have any other thoughts? Uh, I do have one, okay. which is that I think it is time we read the poem again. Whoa. Hey! That would definitely bring me delight. Wow. Just Can FYI, bring... if you want to reciprocate, no big deal. All right, I'll do it. I'll do it immediately. Huzzah. Emplumata. When summer ended, the leaves of snapdragons withered, taking their shrill-colored mouths with them. They were still, so quiet. They were violet, where umber now is. She hated, and she hated to see them go. Flowers born when the weather was good, this she thinks of. Watching the branch of peaches daring their ways above the fence, and further two hummingbirds hovering, stuck to each other, arcing their bodies in grim determination to find what is good, what is given them to find. These are warriors, distancing themselves from history. They find peace in the way they contain the wind and are gone. This is co-host Jack Rossiter Munley. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, head on over to Apple Podcasts. Leave a review. Five stars, maybe? Those reviews help with the algorithm and are a great way for us to find new listeners. And you can put anything in them. You can write whatever you want. You can just say, oh, this is a good podcast. I like this podcast. You could be like, hey, that Connor guy, he makes a lot of good points. Uh, Jack, why is he doing this outro so long? You know, get him off the mic. And whatever you feel like writing, head on over there. Five stars drop in the review uh do you have thoughts about this poem is there a poem or poet you'd like us to cover on a future episode well we'd love to hear from you and there are tons of ways that you can get in touch with us i mean i guess you could drop it into an itunes review you could be like five stars hey why don't you talk about insert name of poet here um but you can also send us an email that's probably the best way to do it close talking poetry at gmail.com is our email address or you can find us on twitter i am at jack rossiter munn connor is at connor m stratton and the show is at close talking on instagram you can find us there too uh we are at close talking poetry and we are on facebook at facebook.com slash close talking we haven't gotten to tiktok yet and we might never who knows anything is anything is possible um, speaking of all those social media platforms, a very special thank you to our incredible social media manager, Corey China, who keeps us active across the internet. And a thank you to all of you for listening. We will see you next time.